Hi friends, hope you're doing well. Today we're going to discuss about Alport syndrome and a few other rare familial glomerular diseases. So the contents of my talk are going to be Alport syndrome. Then we will discuss something called Hanax syndrome. We'll go on to thin basement membrane nephropathy. Discuss about Febreze disease and finish it off with nail patella syndrome. So all these topics have a few named findings which are important from the MCQ point of view. The most important disease from the renal point of view is Alport syndrome. So talking about Alport syndrome, we all know that it is due to mutations in the proteins of type 4 collagen. So in this slide, I want to highlight a few more points that we need to know about type 4 collagen. Now type 4 collagen is the most important constituent of basement membrane collagen. Okay, It is the major constituent of basement membrane collagen. All the basement membranes in the body, type 4 collagen is the main type of collagen. So type 4 collagen can be formed by 6 alpha chains. Yeah, the collagen 4 family has 6 alpha chains, 6 isomeric alpha chains. And each collagen molecule is formed as a heterotrimer. Each collagen molecule is formed as a heterotrimer. So these are the points I want you to remember. Type 4 collagen is the main basement membrane collagen in the whole body. It can be formed from any of the 6 isomeric alpha chains and they are formed by as heterotrimers, they are formed as heterotrimers, which means three alpha chains will join together to form a single collagen molecule. So, what are the different heterotrimers that we know and we need to remember from the exam point of view? So, the first one I want you to remember is alpha 1, alpha 1, alpha 2, which is a constituent of all the basement membranes. Yes, which is a constituent of all the basement membranes and also nascent glomeruli, developmental glomeruli. Developmental glomeruli have alpha 1, alpha 1, alpha 2. The next important thing I want to remember is alpha 3, alpha 4, and alpha 5. Yeah, this is the second heterotrimer we have to remember. This is what is there in mature, mature glomerular basement membrane. <clears throat> mature glomerular basement membrane has alpha 3, alpha 4, and alpha not only the glomerular basement membrane but also the alveolar basement membrane, basement membrane of testis, eye and ear. Okay, it's very easy to remember eye and ear because the main clinical phenotype of Alport syndrome also includes the eye and the ear. So, it's very easy for you to remember. Yeah. And the third one I want you to remember is alpha 5, alpha 5, alpha 6 which is there in the epidermal basement membrane, the skin. Yeah. The epidermal basement membrane of the skin has alpha 5, alpha 5 and alpha 6. The importance we will discuss in the further slides. So this slide beautifully gives us the genomic organization of type 4 collagen. So already I told you there are 6 alpha chains which are encoded by 6 genes call 4 A1 to call 4 A6. Yes and they are arranged as 3 pairs on 3 chromosomes. They are arranged as 3 pairs on 3 chromosomes. Whenever there is 3, there is a potential MCQ because they can add a 4th one and ask an all except question. So, let's see which are the 3 chromosomes. Chromosome 13, chromosome 2 and chromosome X. Chromosome 13, chromosome 2 and chromosome X. The other thing I want you to note here is that the call 4 A5 gene, the call 4 A5 gene which encodes for the alpha 5 chain of type 4 collagen is located on the X chromosome. That's one more thing. Remember, going a little deeper into the structure of the collagen molecule, it has a major collagenous domain, yeah, which has 1400 amino acid residues, 1400 amino acid residues, it has a non-collagenous N terminal and a non-collagenous C terminal. Yes, non-collagenous N terminal and non-collagenous C terminal. So, it has one collagenous domain and two non-collagenous so, it is the interaction between the NC1 part of C terminals that actually forms the heterotrimer. See this oval shape here it is the interaction between three NC1 domains of alpha chains that forms a heterotrimer of type 4 collagen molecule. Okay. Next, let's discuss about the genetics of Alport syndrome. Yeah. So, we have three forms of Alport syndrome X linked Alport syndrome, autosomal recessive Alport syndrome, and autosomal dominant Alport syndrome. So, in this slide, I will tell you the differences between each type of Alport syndrome. So, point number one that I need you to know 
is which is the most common form of alport syndrome it is x linked alport syndrome around 85% of cases are inherited in the x linked fashion the second most common is autosomal recessive alport syndrome and there are very few cases of autosomal dominant alport syndrome so better genetic testing is now telling us that there are more cases of autosomal dominant alport syndrome also uh the second point i want you to know is which is the gene mutated so in x linked alport syndrome it is col4 a5 in x linked alport syndrome it is collagen 4 alpha 5 chain in autosomal recessive as well as autosomal dominant it is alpha 3 or alpha 4 chains yes alpha 3 or alpha 4 chains of type 4 collagen are mutated in autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant the difference being that both the alleles because it's autosomal recessive both the alleles for the gene is deleted is mutated in autosomal recessive and one of the alleles is mutated in autosomal dominant so the most important points i want to highlight here regarding x linked alport syndrome is that number 1 gender differences number 2 genotype phenotype correlation and number 3 the risk of end stage renal disease yes so let's go to a new slide to discuss regarding that we're going to talk about x linked alport syndrome we already told 85% of cases are x linked yes and the mutated gene is col4 a5 now gender difference in x linked alport syndrome the males are more severely affected compared to the females that is point number 1 that we need to understand the severity of the disease in females depends upon the random inactivation of the x chromosome okay depends on how much of the normal x chromosome is silenced in certain cells and how much of the mutated uh, x chromosome is silenced in some other cells so the more the expression of mutated x chromosome the more severe the disease and vice versa males untreated males will definitely go on to develop end stage renal disease yes they will definitely go on to develop end stage renal disease between the age of 10 and 30 pretty early in the second or third decade of life they will definitely go on to develop end stage renal disease that's why alport syndrome is very important from the renal point of view and the third thing about the genotype phenotype correlation so what do i mean by genotype phenotype correlation the type of mutation the type of mutation basically dictates the severity of disease presentation so which are the mutations which are bad okay which are the mutations which are bad deletions are bad yes deletions are bad frame shift mutations are bad and nonsense mutations are bad so this leads to these mutations lead to severe disease yes and splice variant mutations splice variant mutations and missense mutations yes splice variant and missense mutations are associated with less severe disease are associated with less severe disease to the tune of these patients will definitely go on to develop psrd whereas these patients will go on to develop only in 70% and 50% yeah so the risk of esrd is low depending upon the type of mutation that the patient inherits so three points gender differences are there males are more affected than females number one number two the risk of esrd is very high in males and that too it occurs early between the age of 10 and 30 most of them become deaf also and third one genotype phenotype correlation the type of mutation dictates the severity of disease deletions frame shift mutations and nonsense mutations lead to more severe disease compared to splice variants and missense mutation now coming back to autosomal recessive alport syndrome the main thing i wanted to remember is that males and females there is no gender difference in expression both males and females are equally and very severely affected most of them develop end stage renal disease by the age of 30 most of them also develop deafness okay so that is the main point that i wanted to remember in autosomal recessive there is no gender difference in the expression of disease both males and females are equally affected and they develop end stage renal disease by the age of 30 and most of them lose their hearing capacity also 
Talking about autosomal dominant, they have the better prognosis among all the three. They usually have only asymptomatic microhematuria, though a subset of patients go on to develop progressive nephropathy. And the other important point in autosomal dominant is no ocular. Okay, no ocular defects. Ocular defects are not encountered in autosomal dominant Alport syndrome, whereas they are seen in X-linked Alport syndrome as well as autosomal recessive Alport syndrome. So hope you're clear. We'll go to the next slide. So this is an immunofluorescent staining for the alpha 3, alpha 4 and alpha 5 chains of type 4 collagen. So in a normal individual, you can see the stain is taken up, which means the chains are expressed. An X-linked male, X-linked uh, Alport syndrome affected male, there is no uptake of the stains, which means he does not have alpha 3, alpha 4 or alpha 5 chains expressed in his glomerular basement membrane. And in the case of an X-linked Alport syndrome female, you can see mosaicism. Okay, that is a point I want to note here. There is mosaicism, which means some areas there are normal expression, some areas there is abnormal expression. Now, how to differentiate between how to differentiate between X-linked Alport syndrome and autosomal recessive Alport syndrome? There is a, a minute point that I want to note here. In X-linked Alport syndrome, the alpha five chains are not expressed anywhere. Okay. In X-linked Alport syndrome, the alpha 5 chains are not expressed anywhere. Read the glomerular basement membrane, read the tubular basement membrane of distal tubule, read the Bowman's capsule or read the epidermal basement membrane of the skin. In X-linked Alport syndrome, alpha 5 chains are not there anywhere. Whereas in autosomal recessive Alport syndrome, you will have normal alpha 5 chain expression in the distal tubule tubular basement membrane as well as in the Bowman's capsule, as well as the skin, okay. So in autosomal recessive Alport syndrome, you have normal expression of alpha 5 chains, the distal tubule tubular basement membrane, in the Bowman's capsule, as well as the epidermal basement membrane of skin. So one way to differentiate X-linked Alport syndrome and autosomal recessive Alport syndrome is by performing a skin biopsy. The skin, we already know that epidermal basement membrane has alpha 5, alpha 5, alpha 6. So if the chains are expressed normally, then it is not X-linked Alport syndrome. If it is abnormally there, if there is no uptake of the stain, it means the patient has X-linked Alport syndrome. So this next slide demonstrates the point that I just told you. This is the immunofluorescent staining pattern of a patient with autosomal recessive Alport syndrome. You can see that there is no uptake of alpha 3, alpha 4, alpha 5 chains in the glomerulus. Whereas in the Bowman's capsule, which is uh, the arrow, and in the tubular basement membrane of the distal tubule, which is the arrowhead, you can see the uptake of stain. Alpha 5 is normally expressed there. Similarly, if we were to stain the epidermal basement membrane, it would still show uptake of alpha 5. Okay. So that's the point I wanted to put forth. Talking about clinical manifestations of Alport syndrome, let's first discuss the renal defects. The main important point that I want to put forth here is whatever clinical phenotype is seen in Alport syndrome, they are usually not present from birth. They accumulate as the child ages. They accumulate as the child ages. But the only defect that is probably present from birth is microhematuria. That is the point that I want to highlight here. Okay? From birth. This is the only finding that is there from birth. Okay. And as the child ages, the child will go on to develop proteinuria of various quantities. So nephrotic syndrome is uncommon. And then the patient will go on to develop hypertension. And all these will accumulate to end up in end stage renal disease. So that's in short about renal defects. Talking about cochlear defects, okay. The main problem is that the organ of corti. Okay, we all know that organ of corti is present in the cochlea, the inner ear. This is not adherent properly to the basilar membrane. So that's the defect in Alport syndrome. This is not adherent to the basilar membrane. So the patient has a sensory neural hearing loss. The patient has a sensory neural hearing loss. Initially, it is between 2000 to 8000 hertz only. And slowly, it reaches the conversational range also. Right? And uh, talking about ocular defects, very important. Talking about ocular defects. Talking about ocular defects. Three things that I want you to remember. Number one, dot and fleck retinopathy. 
yes dot and fleck retinopathy is what i want you to remember first this is the most common ocular defect this is the most common ocular defect so in the macula macula you have you have a maculopathy uh, where you have dots and flecks dots and flecks of exudates number two anterior lenticolus anterior lenticolus this is a pathognomonic ocular finding in alport syndrome pathognomonic ocular finding in alport syndrome but is unfortunately present only in 15 percent of people percent of patients with excellent alport syndrome have anterior lenticonus it is a pathognomonic finding which is not very common the more common is dot and flex. the third thing is posterior posterior polymorphous dystrophy okay this is due to problem in the decimate membrane okay there are some endothelial vesicles in the cornea it's called posterior polymorphous dystrophy problem in the decimate membrane so coming back, so you have renal defects and the second most common, the most common extra renal defect in uh, Alport syndrome is cochlear defects. I forgot to mention that the most common extra renal defect in Alport syndrome is sensorineural hearing loss, the so cochlear defects and in ocular defects, I already told you dot and flag retinopathy, anterior lenticonus and posterior polymorphous dystrophy. Going to the next one. Uh, some of the minor clinical features you have something called leomatosis whenever the call for a6 gene is also mutated in some forms of in some families of excellent dalport syndrome the call for a6 gene is also mutated along with a5 the a6 gene is also mutated and in such people you can find leomyomas leomyomas where mainly in the esophagus and tracheobronchial tree the esophagus and tracheobronchial tree you can have leomyoma. The other one is aneurysms. Sorry, I cut that out. So aneurysms in the thoracic or the abdominal aorta are also common in some subset of patients with Alport syndrome. And last but not least, some of the hematologic defects were attributed to be as part of Alport syndrome because those patients also had nephropathy and deafness. But ultimately, they found out that the entire genomic profile is different. These people have mutations in the myosin heavy chain, non-muscle myosin heavy chain, the MYH9 gene mutations, which leads to two distinct syndromes. I just would like to mention the syndromes here. One is called Epstein syndrome. One is called Epstein syndrome, where you have nephropathy, you have nephropathy, you have deafness, yeah. Then you have something called mega thrombocytopenia, yeah mega thrombocytopenia and the other syndrome that i want to bring to your attention is called fechner syndrome it's called fechner syndrome okay where you have again nephritis deafness and something called the may haglin anomaly something called the may haglin anomaly don't worry, all these things will be typed beautifully in notes and uploaded in the app. So don't worry about my handwriting. Yeah. So may Heglin anomaly, which are leukocyte inclusions. The two syndromes you have to remember, which were considered to be variants of Alport syndrome, but now recognized as distinct entities due to mutations, not in the collagen 4 genes, but in myosin heavy chain genes, MYH9. So Epstein syndrome and Fechner syndrome. Epstein syndrome is nephritis, deafness, and megathrombocytopenia. But his Fechner syndrome has nephritis, deafness with leukocyte inclusions called the May Heglin anomaly. So, going on to renal biopsy findings in Alport syndrome. Here you have MCQ points in light microscopy, very non specific findings in light microscopy. Ultimately, early in the disease, it may be normal. Early in the disease, it may be normal. Ultimately, as the patient is progressing to renal failure and end-stage renal disease, changes of focal segmental glomerulosclerosis can be seen on light microscopy. Talk about immunohistochemistry, we already discussed about alpha-3, alpha-4, alpha-5, non-expression. They are not expressed properly in the glomerular basement web. That's about uh, the immunohistochemistry. And one more thing I, I want to reiterate once more is the importance of skin biopsy importance of skin biopsy and immunofluorescence, immunohistochemistry in skin biopsy to identify X-linked Alport syndrome. This is not going to work out for autosomal recessive 
because alpha 5 will be normally expressed in the skin for them in the epidermal basement membrane but in X-linked Alport syndrome it will be absent. Electron microscopy findings. So there are classical electron microscopy findings in Alport syndrome. Three things that I want you to remember. Number one, variable thickening and okay. This is very important because we will compare this with thin basement membrane nephropathy. So please remember this point. In Alport syndrome, when you are looking at the glomerular basement membrane under the electron microscope, it will be irregular. There will be areas which are very thick, there will be areas which are thinned out. So that is the most important point in Alport syndrome. Variable thickening and thinning. Then you have basket beaming. You have electron lucent areas. You have empty spaces. That's where the basket weaving. For the basket weaving, they mean something like this. Yeah, so there you have strands and then in between you also have electron lucent areas. So that's the meaning of basket weaving, also called the split basement membranes. Yeah, and multi lamellations are seen as the disease progresses. You have multi lamellation. These four words I wanted to remember variable thickening and thinning, the basket weaving or split basement membrane, and multi lamellation. So going on to diagnosis, okay, how do you diagnose a patient of Alport syndrome? So any child with persistent microhematuria and a positive family history of microhematuria, somebody else in the family also having yeah, you keep Alport syndrome in your differential diagnosis. What are the tools that we have to try and diagnose Alport syndrome? So you have an audiogram and an ophthalmology consult. This we have to audiogram. An ophthalmology consult audiogram to detect sensory neural hearing loss. Yes, we will revise that and uh, ophthalm for both slit lamp and fundoscopy. Fundoscopy more important because dot and flag retinopathy is the more common ocular finding. Please remember that it is not anterior lenticonus. Anterior lenticonus is a pathognomonic finding, but unfortunately, it's uncommon. It's there only in 15 percentage of X linked Alport syndrome. It is dot and flag retinopathy. The maculopathy is more common. You need a fundoscopy and also a slit lamp to see whether there is any lamp. These are very great supplementary evidences of Alport syndrome. Yeah. The third thing, skin biopsy. Okay, the importance of skin biopsy we already. So any patient, any child with persistent microhematuria with problems in the audiogram or slit lamp or even without that, you proceed to do a skin biopsy. You proceed to do a skin biopsy and see if there is normal uptake of the we already know that epidermal basement membrane has alpha 5, alpha 5 and alpha 6. We want to see if the epidermal basement membrane is having normal uptake of alpha 5. If the patient is having an abnormal uptake, it is diagnostic of X-linked Alport syndrome. No uptake, diagnostic of X-linked Alport syndrome, directly label the patient as Alport syndrome. Yes, you need not proceed to do a biopsy. Yes, that's the importance of a skin biopsy. But if it is normal, then you cannot rule out autosomal recessive Alport syndrome. Okay? And in some cases, even in X-linked Alport syndrome, there may be normal expression. So, you may have to proceed. In case it is normal and you still suspect Alport syndrome, then we will go on to do a... In the renal biopsy, it is obviously the immunohistochemistry and electron microscopy that is going to help us. It is immunohistochemistry and electron microscopy that is going to help us light microscopy is unlikely to be helpful early. and the last tool in our armamentarium is genetics directly see for mutations in the collagen 4 alpha alpha genes yeah a3 a4 a5 that will help us clinch the diagnosis of alport syndrome and also the type of inheritance okay. so i have uploaded some mcqs clinical scenario mcqs uh, which highlights the algorithm for diagnosis of Alport syndrome. Okay, you will see that. So, talking about treatment, the last part of Alport syndrome. So, there is no specific therapy for Alport syndrome. It is only renin angiotensin system blockade that is going to help. Renin angiotensin system blockade that is going to help you. So, the drug that has been extensively studied is extensively okay. studied is aramiprid. So, this will reduce the proteinuria and reduce the progression of the patient's to 8 years RT. So, the trial that I want to remember here is early protect trial. Okay. What is the, this is an ongoing trial. The results are probably just published. So, early protect trial is trying to give us guidelines as to when to start a 
So as of now, the guideline says that Remipril has to be started only when the patient has overt proteinuria. Just because there is a diagnosis of Alport syndrome and microhematuria, you need not start Remipril. You have to wait for overt proteinuria to start. Periodically follow up the patient, look for urine protein excretion, and then start Remipril when there is overt proteinuria. But the early protect trial is trying to give us guidelines whether preemptive Remipril therapy will protect the kidney. Okay, regarding its safety, we are awaiting the results as we speak. And uh, talking about transplantation, that is the end. Okay, dialysis and transplantation is the thing for end stage renal, obviously. So, in transplant, there is just a couple of points that I want to highlight. Okay, for example, you have a son with Alport syndrome, and then the mother is ready to give her kidney, donate her kidney. Very common scenario. So, can you allow her to donate the kidney? Okay, because she may be having uh, X linked Alport syndrome as well, but because she is a female, she's probably not manifested the disease yet. So, they have found out that in patients, in female patients who are donating kidneys in Alport syndrome, 40% of patients went on to develop severe proteinuria and hypertension in the other kidney after donation. They found out that. So it is the decision of family and doctor together after counseling them regarding the risks, probably we can go ahead with uh, kidney donation. But in case the mother is already having hematuria, already having proteinuria, already having hypertension, she is uh, not fit to donate her kidney to her child. But in case she has not developed these manifestations, after counselling, you may advise her. Yeah? So, going on to the next thing called Hanax syndrome. Very simple, I just need you to know the abbreviation basically. It's a very rare disease. It's hereditary angiopathy with nephropathy, aneurysms and tumors. Okay? So, talking about aneurysm, we are talking about retinal aneurysms and intracranial aneurysm. So you can have the side effects of intracranial aneurysms, uh, the intracranial hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage and retinal aneurysm. Retinal aneurysm. Muscle cramps, muscle cramps is one so the patient can have least creatinine the patient can have least creatinine kinase and they also go on to develop nephropathy characterized by hematuria and it is inherited in a autosomal fashion. And the mutations are there in the call for a one chain. So far, we discussed about mutations in three, four, five. Geometomosis, metamosis, process. We discussed about collagen uh, a six gene mutation also. And here we are discussing about call for a one gene mutation, missense mutation causing an syndrome. Next one is thin basement membrane nephropathy. We are going to talk about thin basement membrane nephropathy. This is the most common cause of persistent microhematuria in both children as well as adults. This is the most common cause of persistent microhematuria in children and adults. that's the most important thing. It's a benign disease, benign prognosis. Uh, very few patients are going to develop progressive neuropathy and most of those patients also probably have uh, Alport syndrome. Okay? So we'll go into the similarities. So in this also, in this also, there is thinning of the base member. There is thinning of the base member. But the major difference from this and Alport syndrome is that Alport syndrome, I already told you, has variable thickening and there is variable thickening and thinning. Whereas in thin basement membrane nephropathy, you have uniform thinning. The width of the glomerular, glomerular basement membrane is going to be uniform throughout. So we thinned uniformly. Therefore, there is minimal, minimal intraglomerular variability. That is the most important point. No. And how does it differ from Alport syndrome? Number one, extra renal manifestations are rare in thin basement membrane nephropathy. We are definitely talking about deafness and ocular defects. These are very uncommon in thin basement membrane. Proteinuria, hypertension, and end stage renal disease are also very unusual in thin basement. Benign nephropathy, only microhematuria, which is going to be there lifelong. And uh, proteinuria, hypertension, and ESRD are not at all common. And if at all the patients do progress, do have progressive nephropathy, they are go not going to develop it before the age of 40, like Alport syndrome. Okay? And no gender differences. We already saw excellent like Alport syndrome, how males are differentially affected compared to females and the inheritance is only autosomal dominant in thin basement nephropathy. They can have mutations in all three, sorry, all four A3 or A4 loci. Okay. Collagen 4, A3, alpha 3 or alpha 4 loci. 
they can have yeah and one more thing that i want to uh, highlight here okay one more thing that i want to highlight here is the concept of sin pharyngitic hemisphere yeah sin pharyngitic hemisphere which means developing hematuria or exacerbation of hematuria during and after respiratory so we already know very well that iga nephropathy is the prototype example for sin pharyngitic hemisphere where the patient develops macro hematuria not micro macro hematuria during episodes of uh, upper respiratory tract like within 24 hours they will develop it. this is also seen in hope syndrome this is also seen in hypoxic syndrome and thin basement in nephropathy that is what i want yeah sin pharyngitic hematuria although uncommon is seen macro hematuria really they have micro hematuria they can have episodes of macro hematuria during an upper respiratory tract infection not only in ig nephropathy but also alport syndrome and thin basement one more point i want to highlight yeah so immunostaining yeah so in thin basement membrane nephropathy you will have normal immunostaining that will be normal uptake of alpha 3 alpha 4 and these are the differences between alport syndrome and thin basement membrane main thing in imaging we saw there is minimal variation in thickness and extraordinary manifestations rare stage in the disease rare no gender differences autosomal dominant inheritance where is the mutation called for a3 a4 so next let's talk about febreze disease okay very important from the mcq point of view febreze disease okay this is a lysosomal storage disorder this is a lysosomal storage disorder one of the enzymes that is found inside the lysosome of our cells is deficient because of that a product is going to accumulate inside the cells as simple as that so that what is the enzyme the enzyme is called alpha galactosidase a okay it's a lysosomal enzyme alpha galactosidase a is the deficient enzyme in febris disease so because of this what is the product that is getting accumulated two names gb3 globo Trioyosyl ceramide, globo trioyosyl ceramide, and also called as ceramide trihexoside. It's an easier name to pronounce. Ceramide trihexoside. So, this is the product GB3 or ceramide trihexoside is the name of the product that is accumulated inside the cells due to the deficiency of alpha galactosidase A. So, what is the name of the gene? The name of the gene is GLA gene. Okay, the gene that codes for alpha galactosidase A is called GLA gene it is located in the X chromosome so again you have males more commonly affected in Febreze disease so which are the main systems that are involved in Febreze disease it is the kidneys the heart the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system so these are the main systems that are affected due to accumulation of ceramide trihexoid so quickly going into the clinical manifestations what are the renal clinical manifestations so mainly manifests as proteinuria it manifests as protein so in the urine you have specific findings of fat bodies there are a lot of urinary fat bodies due to the region of the gb3 yeah and under polarized light yes under polarized light you can see them as the maltese cross appearance so maltese cross appearance is uh, something like this so this type of appearance is seen on polarized light in the urine of patients with Febreze disease due to increased urinary excretion of G. So Maltese cross is something that we have to do. There's another Maltese cross RBC inclusions in Debesiosis if you remember. So the other one is an electron microscopy finding. The other one is an electron microscopy finding. So myelin figures or zebra bodies. So these are the intracellular accumulation of G3 are arranged either in concentric whorls and it's called figures or in parallel clusters so called zebra bodies this is an electron microscope so three things i wanted to remember proteinuria which will ultimately lead to end stage renal disease if untreated you have maltese cross oval fat bodies in the urine which is a and under polarized light the maltese cross appearance is there 
and myelin figures or zebra bodies is the accumulation of GB3 inside the cell seen on electron microscope. So, when does ESRD occur? Okay, ESRD usually occurs between the 4th and 5th decade. This is a very commonly revisited MCQ point because uh, no one expects uh, Fabry's disease which is an inherited enzyme deficiency to go so long and cause ESRD. Option, this probably will be the D option, the last option. You can have 1st to 2nd decade, 2nd decade, 3rd to 4th decade. Yeah, so it leads to, it's a slowly progressive disease and the proteinuria will ultimately lead to ESRD if untreated. And that happens between the 4th and the 5th decade. That's what's very important. Too. So, what are the cardiac manifestations? So, you can have, due to the deposition of GB3 in the coronary vessels, you can have ischemia, you can have angina and myocardial infarction. Due to the deposition of GB3 in the conduction system, you can have arrhythmias, you can have increased left ventricular mass, ultimately leading to cardiac failure. Okay? Congestive heart failure can be there left ventricular hypertrophy can be there. In fact, there is a form of Fabry's disease which involves a single system. Usually, it is a multi-system disorder, but there is a form of Fabry's system that is isolated only to the heart and the finding is LVH in that group of patients. So, this is a figure, just to come back to the figure, yeah. So, here you can see the fat in the inclusions of uh, GB3 in the glomeruli, yeah. You can see this taking up the oil red o stain. Okay, the glycosphingolipid. Okay, GB3 is a glycosphingolipid. So you can it, it is taken up by the oil red o stain, which is for fats. So you can see that uh, in the glomeruli deposits. And this is the electron microscopy picture. You can see the zebra bodies and myelin world. Myelin figures or zebra bodies you can see here. So, talking about the nervous system, this is the most common presenting symptom. Yeah, acral pain and paresthesias and sweating abnormalities in a young child is the uh, classical presenting feature of Fabry's disease. So, if, if they are giving you a case vignette, a case vignette based question, this is going to be the presenting symptom. A young child coming to you with pain in his extremities and uh, sweating abnormalities, hypohydrosis. Yeah, hypohydrosis. Lack of sweating is so this is the main symptom. Uh, and as the disease progresses, they can have vertebro basilar insufficiencies. We can have dizziness, vertigo, vomiting, ataxias due to vertebro basilar insufficiency. They can have posterior circulation strokes, and they can also have dementias. Talking about skin, okay. Initially, the entire Fabry's disease was called angiokeratoma corporis diffusum. Angiokeratoma corporis diffusum. These are nothing but dilated veins. Okay, dilated veins with hyperkeratotic covering. Dilated veins with hyperkeratotic covering. That is angiokeratoma corporis diffusum. And where is it usually located? It is usually located between the umbilicals and the mid thighs. So that's why it's called roughly called below the belt. So you have the area below the umbilicals. Uh, that is the lower abdomen, the buttocks, uh, the front and back of the thighs, the genital areas. These are the areas where the angiokeratomas are usually concentrated. And there is also a very common finding in the eye. It's called vortex keratopathy. Yeah, it's called vortex keratopathy. It does not disturb the vision. That's an important point. Vortex keratopathy. Vortex keratopathy. It's also called cornea verticillata. These are concentric whorls on the cornea which are seen in Fabry's disease. It is also seen very commonly in people of chronic amiodarone therapy. Also seen commonly in people taking amiodarone for a long time. So diagnosis and treatment. So you can culture uh, fibroblasts in vitro or you can check the levels in serum or you can check the levels of the alpha galactosidase A enzyme in the uh, WBCs also. And you will find absent enzyme activity or greatly decreased enzyme. Okay, so that's one thing. You can look for urinary GB3, which will be increased obviously, and you can directly go for genetics and identify the mutation in GLA gene X chromosome. And what is the treatment? The treatment is luckily you have it called Fabrazine, which is A galsidase beta. There's another A galsidase alpha also. So this enzyme replacement therapy has a revolution treatment of 
Febreze disease, but unfortunately, it's very costly. It's cost prohibitive. It's given as twice weekly infusions, an IV infusion once in every two weeks for around five to six months, and then you assess the treatment, uh, response to treatment, then go ahead. So they found out that it uh, greatly helps with the symptoms of neuropathic pain after five to six months of treatment. The level of urinary GB3 is going to reduce. The level of uh, ceramide trihexoside deposition in the heart, the kidneys, and the urine, and the nerves are all going to reduce. So there's going to be improvement in uh, left ventricular mass, the left reduce, neuropathic pain reduce, uh, the urinary levels of GP3 is going to reduce. But whether it translates into good long term outcomes, especially from the kidney point of view, is unknown. Okay? Uh, this the implication is that suppose somebody already has established renal failure, then the question of agalcidase beta, especially with the cost constraints, is debatable. But if the patient has not yet developed renal failure, definitely they must uh, get the enzyme debate. The last topic that we are going to discuss is called the nail patella syndrome. This is again rare and autosomal dominantly inherited. Okay. Uh, so, quickly revising Alport syndrome, you have all three types of inheritance. X linked is most common. Anax syndrome is autosomal dominant. Then we discuss about thin basement membrane nephropathy, autosomal dominant. We discuss about Fabry's disease, which is X linked again. The last one, nail patella syndrome, autosomal dominant. So, three out of five is autosomal. It's again, rare autosomal dominant. So, you have skeletal defects, the name goes, and the main skeletal defect is absent or hypoplastic patella. Absent or hypoplastic patella. Okay. Similarly, they can have absent or hypoplastic elbows also. Patella is the pathogenic thing. The other thing is they can have ex osteosis from the iliac bones. So that's called the iliac horns. From the posterior part of iliac wings, they can have. Uh, bony outgrowths, it's called iliac horns. This is also pathognomonic for nail metal syndrome. Uh, and nails, bilateral symmetric, bilateral symmetric dystrophic nails can be seen in nail syndrome. Another point, the pathognomonic is triangular lunula. Triangular lunula is a pathognomonic sign. Okay. So, coming to skeletal, absent or hypoplastic patella, absent or hypoplastic elbows also, I mentioned that here. The third one I want you to remember is iliac horn. And in nails, bilateral symmetric dystrophic changes and triangular lunula is a pathognomonic in nail patella. Talking about renal, they will have turia, they will have proteinuria, but it's usually a benign nephropathy. Less than 50% of the patients uh, will go on to develop clinically apparent renal disease itself. Okay, if 100 people have nail patella syndrome, less than 50 of them are going to develop even clinically apparent renal disease. And even in that percent proportion of patients, only three to five patients will have a progressive nephropathy leading to end stage renal disease. So it's a benign nephropathy. That's what we need to remember. Uh, the most important point that I wanted to tell you here is moth-eaten GBM. Moth-eaten GBM. This is an electron microscopic finding in nail petella syndrome. Moth eaten GBM. So, I'm going to show you a picture of that. So, this is an electron microscopy picture of a patient with nail petella syndrome. You can see that the GBM is having lot of lucent areas. Lot of lucent areas. So, this is why it's called a moth eaten GBM appearance. And in this lucent areas, they have found out an accumulation of type 3 collagen fibers. Type 3 collagen fibers are found in excess inside this uh, lucent area. So, those are two points that I want to tell you. So, thank you. I'll meet you in the next video. You can find the notes for this class in the NeuraAccess Pro app.